Thank you for tuning in to another edition of the Business of Fun podcast. I'm Dave Wakeman. Guess what? I'm dropping this episode the week of January 16th, 2023. And next week, the week of January 23rd through the 26th, I will be in Seattle, Washington with the folks at Cover Genius at Entix. Uh, you can find me at the Cover Genius booth on Wednesday doing some live podcasting right from their booth. We're going to call it eight minutes at Intix. It's going to be amazing. And then on Thursday at the inspiration stage, I will be hosting a panel discussion with Joe from Cover Genius, uh, Joanne from Audience View, and one other surprise guest. Uh, we're going to be talking about the customer journey. And it's going to be a, a nice conversation about how you can better understand uh, and guide customers through your customer journey. Very important topic as we continue to recover uh, from the lockdowns and the pandemic and all of the other challenges that people are dealing with right now. Uh, my guest today is Chris Fernell from On The Mark. And uh, this one is a different one because we wanted to cover a specific idea, which is something I'm probably going to do a little bit more of this year. Uh, we wanted to talk about how do you get change to stick in your organization. Before I tell you a little bit more about my conversation with Chris, though, I want to remind you to visit my website. It's www.davewakeman.com. Also, you can get the Talking Tickets newsletter by visiting talkingtickets.substack.com. Again, that's talkingtickets.substack.com. That's where you get ticket stuff. You can also get the Business of Value dot substack dot com. The business of value is my weekly newsletter about strategy, marketing, pricing, and all this stuff. I have been running a pricing survey right now. I want to understand uh, where the people who have the role in the pricing decision, uh, the challenges they're encountering, and some of the things that they feel like they need to learn. Uh, partly for my own knowledge, because I am going to get a chance to teach this year, and I am going to be teaching a, an applied brand manage, management course uh, the executive level MBAs but some of those lessons will trickle out to you uh, so I will put a link to that survey in the show notes so check that out um, but back to Chris so Chris Fernell is from on the mark and they are he is based in London uh, but they are a global uh, consulting firm Chris came to me with the idea of talking about change change is a topic that I have covered extensively over the years and our conversation is built around the idea of get not just change but making sure that change stays with you in the organization um, so we talked about um, you know who needs to collaborate and change we talked about the paradox of change and the challenges you encounter as change becomes a part of your organization um, how fragmented and sub-optimized organizations struggle with change. We talk about how old patterns die hard, um, the power of choices. Um, you know, we talked about my idea that change is going to happen no matter what. So um, how do you deal with constant change when change is inevitable? Um, we talk about how fragmentation is the enemy of success. We talk about systems level thinking. We hit upon things like... Uh, When's the right time to talk about strategy? Uh, you, how you should never say we won't do something, right? We talk about the skepticism of change. This is like a whole master class with Chris on the idea of change and how to create change in your organization. Um, so stick with it. It's totally worth it. Um, it really was interesting for me to spend so much time on one specific angle. Uh, so hopefully you dig this. Uh, this is my conversation with Chris Fernell from On The Mark on the Business of Fun podcast. It's because you come at this from a different angle uh, than I do. And you have this concept that I think I'm going to butcher. Well, it's likely me is going to screw this up, but you call it the paradox of change. Can you tell us that as like a jumping off point for the conversation? Yeah, sure. Sure, Dave. Um, and a lot of this is based on, uh, you know, a, a good number of years of, of lived experience, both both my own, you know, 15, 16 years experience, but also that of the the collective team at, at On The Mark. And we've been doing this work for, for well over 30 years now. And I guess... At the heart of the sort of the paradox of change that we seem to experience, really, there's there's three things that I thought maybe we'd just state up front as things that we may all um, be able to connect to, whether personally or we observe that in our everyday life or or certainly change as it relates to 
uh, organizational life. Um, and here they are, Dave, right? Um, the first thing is, I'm hoping you'd agree with me and listeners would agree with me that that there isn't a single leader on the planet, don't care where you're from, what country you're in, but there isn't a single leader on the planet that wouldn't like to reduce the lag time between decisions that are made, the execution of those decisions and the results or the, or the impact, right? So, so there's mm-hmm. the first point. Um, nobody's going to disagree with that, I don't think. Now, number two is that the, the challenge is, is within that decision to execution to results, there's this thing that we grapple with called change. Now, one of the fundamental challenges that we look at with change as it relates to the paradox, here's, here's my second assumption, Dave, is that change is often built on belief systems that change is really hard for people, that they're, they're naturally resistant and, and all change is difficult. There's the mm-hmm. second one. Now, the third one is perhaps a bit of a leap away from what people might make a connection with sort of everyday organizational changes. Not enough leaders really understand the practical first principles of good strategy, which leaves this very notion that every organization should be able to answer and align its people around, which is how do we create value or how do we create impact? And what we often find in our work is is because of that lack of understanding down to a practical first principle level of good strategy, it it often leaves in an organization the inability to have a consistent answer to how do we create value. So those are my those are my sort of three headline points, uh, Dave, in in that. uh, What are we really talking about when it comes to perhaps some of the paradoxes of, of change? All right. So let me let me get let me see if I have this straight before we even get going, because then I have a question. Um, there's no one. There's nobody that we know of, probably like lead, uh, the, no leader, at least, who would want to that doesn't want to reduce the time between the decision and the results. Right. right. You, and and that, that's my whole um, st- business strategy for my consulting practice is like, oh, how fast can I get you results? Because. Uh, I don't want to be around any longer than you need me either. So, so, so that's me. Uh, number two is that is bu- there's built on the belief that change is hard. And this is where my question is going to come up because I give a talk pretty regularly, uh, uh, the courage to change. And we will get into that in a second because I think that I'm going to be curious about your take on this. And then third, most people don't know what strategy is, and I would absolutely agree, and I don't want to talk about that because I don't want to give people any of my secret sauce. Okay, so I, I, they, they need to continue to hire me. So, But that's I think it's true. Uh, I did some research, and I found out that um, – Really, it's about 50 percent of people don't their organizations don't even have a strategy. Um, most of, about 80 percent of what people call strategy is not strategy, is not even close to strategy. And then of the 60 percent of people that do have a strategy, it's mostly a grab bag and a wish list of things that people hope will happen as opposed to a series of choices that are going to help them make that more likely than not to happen. But. We'll get to all that in a second. Let me start, though, but with point two, which is about change is built on this belief that change is hard for people. And what I tell people is actually like change isn't hard at all. Change is going to come for you no matter what. The only thing that you have is you can either embrace it or you can stick your head in the sand like an ostrich and hope that it doesn't happen. One gives you a greater likelihood of coming out of the other side of change successfully. Uh, just letting change happen to you is uh, is frightening, and you know it's unproductive. Um, and so I'm kind of curious, like from your point of view, you know, a am I wrong, or and b, you know, what is your you know what is your approach to leading people through change? Yeah, and and you know y- you're right, and there's there's probably quite a lot to unpack just in those first three points that I shared. But if we as we look at at, if, as we look at this sort of whole notion of change is hard for people, um, the one of the things that that I often find leaders and teams grappling with is is um, you know what are we really talking about when it does come to change? These big changes that or, that organisations tend to go through, whether that's around um, a, a technology change maybe, or we need to fundamentally change processes in the organization, or we're going to change product or service that we offer, and therefore that brings change. You know, there's this thing that is often associated in organizational change, which is this big thing 
that happens out there, which has its implicit link to it's somebody else's job, right? And I come, Dave, from in the manufacturing lines 15 years ago, working those lines. Um, and, and, and I often, you know, grew up with that feeling that if it's organizational change, then it's not my job, it's somebody else's. But at the same time, every single day in the organization, people are needing to adapt to things that they didn't, they didn't think was going to happen. Things that are perhaps unpredictable, or some might argue were, were and are possibly um, able to be predicted if we were to slow down and work in a different way. But 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 my point is, is you've got this constant stuff that happens every single day that some people might say is just continuous adaptation and, and improvement. And, and, and let's put that in one bucket. Then you've got this other organizational change, which is often seen, again, as somebody else's job, perhaps a leader's job. And um, when that change happens, I'll know about it because somebody will tell me. And that word there, Dave, is, is what we grapple with all the time is about telling people into change. It's just not possible. And people will say, well, isn't that a bit of a, uh, you know, a, a sort of a binary or, or, or blunt statement, Chris, because surely that, you know, sometimes change does happen where in an emergency or a crisis situation, we're coming out of a global pandemic, there's things happening and people just say, uh, you know, uh, point east, head down that direction, and I'm going to tell you what to do. Sure, but I'm contextualizing this in the big organizational change that perhaps you and I, um, you know, might be be, be uh, accustomed to in our in our career. But the coming back to that point of the change is built on belief systems that that where that, that it's just naturally hard for people and they're resistant leads to a set of choices, often by leaders, on how they approach change. If at the starting point, they believe that people are going to find this hard anyway, and it's their very next choice that we find uh, in our work uh, really interesting. So let me ask you this then, because you you talk there's adapting to change and it's like, what do we talk about when we talk about change to steal uh, and, and co-op the title of a, a really famous Raymond Carver uh, short story collection? Um why do people struggle? And and I'm asking this from the point of view of I don't necessarily do anything unless we have defined what success looks like at the very start. And I right. know that people struggle with that greatly. Um, and I think, you know, and so I'm my, the question is going to be, you know, why do people struggle with this so much? And I'm going to give you my opinion before I turn it over to you just to give you a chance to grab your thoughts, because I'm curious if your experience reflects mine, which is like a lot of times people haven't thought about this, uh, what, what success really looks like. And part of it's like we're in this sort of doom loop of tactification, right, where everything's driven by like quarter to quarter or day to day activities when strategic things uh, by their essence, you have to step back and understand where success is going. And that, I think that's where when you talk about people don't understand the first principles, to me, that seems what what like what it is, is like there's a fear of taking the step back because they might not like what they see. And so as a form of comfort, they dig into this tactification. And because they're so, so inbred into the tactics and constantly being, um, and I'm using air quotes here, busy. They don't necessarily ever understand what success really looks like. And you can go years with like, you know, meeting your expectations, but are your expectations right? Uh, and, it's be, you know, so I'm curious, you know, what you see and what your experience is, because that's sort of where I get it. It's a there's a fear, the, uh, the fear of looking back because you might not like what you see. And then it just drives people to take tactic, tactic, tactic. And it's just action for the sake of action a lot of times. Right. Right. And there's I and think people don't even know they would tell. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. They don't even realize this because they don't have any distance. So they're going like, I'm doing a great job. And I go, well, what are you trying to achieve? Well, I'm trying to get this thing done. And they they don't know what they're really trying to achieve. Right. And there's uh, uh, Dave, you've tempted me with it with a point I, I'd like to come back to a bit later, um, which is um, what we would call uh, the, the enemy. For, for a business success is is what we would call fragmentation and, and sub-optimization. And, and let me just signpost that around the fragmented part of almost what you've just described, as you said to me earlier on, well, well, let's not talk about strategy, let's stick with change. And therein lies the problem in an organization, 
is the way in which people uh, compartmentalize or fragment these things. Strategy is often different to change, is then different to the delivery of day to day operations and, and so on and so on. And you can find all of these examples, particularly in big transformation, um, you know, transformational change programs in organizations where they fragment all of those things. Now, at the heart of that is a separation between strategy or let's put it more simply, where are we headed? What is our destination in terms of our mm -hmm. target point? And really for us, that's about practically saying, how do we create value in our market of choice? And then align everybody in the organization about that very choice. Here's what we're going to choose to do and not do. What then makes it, in our experience, back to your question about what makes change hard, is people generally in an organization are not involved in the process until the answer around, OK, we need to redesign this part of the organization. We need to stop this service and reroute our resources over here. It's it's pretty often, Dave, to walk around, you know, uh, an awful lot of organizations around the world to say, who does that work there? Who does that thinking and translation into the change objective? And I tell you from a lot of experience, it's often leaders. The time back to my manufacturing days that I'd be tapped on the shoulder to say, hey, Chris, we're going to change is when the solution has already been mostly designed. Mm -hmm. And somebody might be saying to me, what's your opinion? Now, herein lies the skepticism that, that creeps in because people say really in their mind, do you really want to know my opinion or is this more than a half baked solution? And therefore, you're sort of coming out to me with some degree of uh, uh, what I would call manipulation and coercion to say, Dave, honestly, uh, what we're finding here in lived experience is leaders are owning too much of this process. By the time the employees, the wider workforce are involved, the leader is leaning forward and they're saying, hey, Dave, this is a really good idea, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And and therefore, for us, this, the, the central premise for our work is um, is to say there's an awful lot of social behavioral and neuroscience that that goes into this uh, in terms of our approach is we number one we don't separate any of these things so strategy change delivery it's all an integrated experience because one decision in your strategy leads to you know the next and the yep. next mm -hmm. and it's a layering effect but at the heart for us is uh, people support what they help to create and if they're fundamentally not involved upstream in these big decisions and the potential implications and the assumptions we make about those implications, then there's this terrible word, Dave, that people use. It's all over organizations, which is called buy in. People don't buy in to change or they don't buy into solutions. And, and it's a word in on the mark that we ban. We don't use the word buy in but on the premise that in all of our work, we live by the principle that says people support what they help to create, which is fundamentally about participation and involvement from the very beginning to the very yep. end. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's absolutely right. Um, and and I know that because there's been several things that I've worked on uh, recently, right? And they, they they will end up being big uh, organizational change, right? They're like big investments, the whole deal. Um, the most important thing was actually, you know, and I don't have as strict of a rule about saying buy-in as you do, but it's only. But I think the use of buy-in for me is probably similar to the way you ban it. And it's that I want to get everybody involved early because I make sure that they I get out any objections or any ideas at the start because I don't want to offer something that has no chance of working. And I don't want to necessarily I don't want to not listen to the people who are closest to the customers. Right. Or who are closest to the end product, because they're going to have ideas and solutions that are probably pretty commonsensical and probably pretty much um, can be implemented all right away. So, uh, you know, and that, that's my experience. But I want to go back to this thing is like where you talk about how do we create value and what strategy is about two questions. And it's um, and I'm curious. I want to hear your opinion on this. But you said it's all about what we will do and what we won't do. Which one of those to you is more important? Because I have a definite opinion on this. Um, so instinctively, it's the latter. It is um, an organization's inability to say, here's the things that we won't do. And what we often find, uh, uh, back to my um, opening uh, sort of assumption or observation that not enough leaders really understand that, the, you know, the practicalities of good strategy, which really does boil down to 
how do we create value? And from that, what do we choose to do? And what do we choose not to do? Yeah. I've read um, strategy papers, Dave, in, in my career and, and the work we do at On The Mark that are upwards of 120 pages long. Okay, we've lost the plot if we cannot describe our strategy in less than what I would say is three simple pages. Here's how we create value. One page, Chris, one page. One page. I'm happy to go to a page. It's really simple. Here's how we create yes. value in very practical terms. Here's what we do and here's what we don't do. What you often find is almost a, 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 a an actually an inherent desire to be all things to everyone. And Correct. therefore, we're going to do lots of things all the time, but we'll not do any one of those things deeply well in terms of a point of specialism or, or value. And, and and again, there's the challenge is I'm, I'm integrating a lot of these points now together, Dave, because we can't have a coherent conversation without sort of joining the dots between these things, which is if our strategy isn't fundamentally clear and not everybody is clear on the value that we fundamentally create and therefore the choices we do and we don't do. By the time that this goes to an organization of 50, 500, 5,000, 50,000 people or more, then what I can tell you from experience is that people make their own interpretations in an organization and then they make their own choices. And then this whole notion of a leader wanting to perhaps control and rein that thing in is really difficult when they are trying to set direction and overly control strategy and change as a small strategic group and then essentially tell people into change. And we're back to my point about people support what they help to create. And if they're involved in the process, not only do you get a common language about what we're trying to do, but you also get a common and thorough alignment about this is the path we're taking, which means we're making these choices with these implications and we're not choosing to do these things anymore. And it's the fundamental part of people saying, I was involved in the process, I understand it, I may not fundamentally agree with it, but I'm willing to trade off my own personal views because we are all in this conversation together for collective good and not self-interest. Yeah, I'll put it like this and I'll see what you say. Um, I know that like a lot of times when people, you know, you'll have like your quarterly earnings reports, or you'll have your annual meetings or whatever. And then like the CEO or the executive director, or whomever uh, comes up and, and then they talks about the new plan. And it's, it's I, if I had if it was, this was a visual podcast, I would have like a big slide that had in like the biggest font I could get the big plan. Right. Is there. And then they go, I'm going to go on the road or I'm going to go to all of the staff and sell the plan. Right. Which goes back to buy in. The organizations that I see do this well, do that, do strategy well. And again, in my research, it's going to be 20 percent or less of businesses. And I. And, uh, my my experience says it's less than 10 percent have really good strategies um, that stick is. But you should never. But the organization that does well would never say that we have to go sell our plan to the comp the rest of the company, because by the time it's developed, th there's been enough voices that come through. It all becomes common sense. Right. It's uh, you've exposed what people already know underneath. Right. Or deep inside, you know, they might not have wanted to look at these these things, but kind of if you've done a good job of the, of the strategy uh, setting process, you've taken the time so that you've uncovered things. And a lot of what you're doing is going to seem like common sense, because this it, one of the big points you make is the idea of trying to be everything to everyone versus your core competencies. It should just be logical to people that some businesses do things better than others. And so why would you not double down on what you do well versus trying to do a little bit of everything, right? Because people aren't coming to you for a rinse and repeat. They're coming to you for something special that you do. It's an idea that I, I just finished an article for a, uh, a retail organization, um, the trade association in New Zealand and Australia, relative differentiation. How am I better compared to the other alternatives we have? Um, but I'm curious, like, you know, with this idea of never having to sell the plan because it seems commonsensical, uh, you know, what is that? Am I wrong or, you know, or, or is that unique to me or is it just, you know, is that something you see as well? Yeah, it's it's something we see every day of the week, uh, day 365. And I come back to that, um, this again, this notion that we opened up with, which is um, 
uh, you know, every leader wakes up in the morning wanting to reduce that lag time between, you know, let's for a moment say that the fundamental decisions that impact a company's business model is, let's just say momentarily to senior management's uh, accountability, right? That That's one thing that they are on the hook for. And that's not to say that other people can't contribute it, but but that's their that's their principal responsibility. Now it's no good in your example of working with the the, the, the retail example that that only the senior leadership team understand that those choices about what we're doing and what we're not not doing, and then faced with this sort of diffusion of information because they're going to be sat around in a month, if six months maybe, wondering why there is such a significant lag time or ineffective execution between what they've said the strategy is and what they've told people to do. And, and and we're back to one of those paradoxes, which is, so if leaders want to reduce that lag, lag time, then they've got to involve people in the process. And that for us is a, at the heart of a real difficulty with traditional leadership, which is no judgment against the individual leader themselves. It's, this, it's the work system that they've been conditioned and brought up to, to say, Chris, how can I possibly involve of let's say in a workforce of 5000 people how can i involve 3 4 or even all 5000 of those people in strategy development surely that takes a long time and our challenge back to them is here's your here's your trade off dave you pay now or you pay later so you pay now and you invest that effort up front which isn't months of effort but it takes skill and a high degree of structure and discipline mm-hmm. to facilitate that process. You pay now, you invest your effort up front, and you see the adoption and the execution go through the roof. And when we get to that point about impact and results, it's even better than what you thought it would be. Or you pay later, you do what we would often see in this belief system of change is hard. The other choice that leaders make is say, OK, well, if it, if we think it's going to be naturally hard for people anyway, then we'll do this in a small group. We'll do it fast and then we'll tell the organization what to do. And then our pay later uh, point is that you're then paying downstream with weeks, months, if not years of effort to try and convince and cajole people into doing what you're telling them to do. And we're back to the psychology point, which says if I wasn't part of the if I wasn't involved and I wasn't part of the process, then I don't properly understand it. And therefore, I'm making my own choices locally Mm -hmm. about what I choose to implement and what I choose not to. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about that, too. You're making your, your these things, um, your decisions locally because you weren't a part of the process. You don't necessarily feel connected to it. It has you have to get the, the bad word for you at on the mark is buy in. You right. know, uh, right. How important and, and this is to me, this is a super important because I find that um, a lot of the challenges come because of a lack of shared language. Right. right? And there's no definition. And I guess that probably goes back to where we started when we were talking about um, defining success from the very start. How important is this shared language? Because a lot of times what I see, again, this is just me, um, is that everybody, you know, we can take any term, right? We can take premium, we can take uh, luxury, we can take uh, retail or service, any of these things. Um, and they're diff- everybody has a different definition. And what ha- ends up happening in my experience is that it drags people all over the, the map. And so then your strategy can never be consistently delivered because everybody has a different definition. You know, how important when you're dealing with people, is it, imp- it does it become to get everybody on the same page where the definitions are clear, where the um, the language that's used clear, right, where it becomes almost um you cult like, you know, in, in your devotion to a shared language. It, well, uh, vitally important, Dave. I, I think you knew I was going to say that. But but if I put that into context of the pay now choice, which is you have to pay upstream and have people involved in as they create this solution, they are they are coming to an aligned um, understanding about what's going on in today's world organizationally, whether that's to do with how we are operating, whether that's to do with our strategic choices and more around our, our, our business model versus the operating model. But you are aligning people to what is going on and in doing so, creating that common database of what's happening, but also a common language. And of course, sooner or later, they shift focus to the future to say, so what are we going to do in future? I think aligning the language is almost a, a consequence of involving people so for us, it's less working really hard on that language, more about continuity of working with a group and then increasing the participation across the organization 
when you then bring others in across the organization and get to that two, three, four, five thousand number that I uh, used as an illustration earlier, people are being onboarded and aligned to that language, not to be manipulated or coerced, but a, a sense of here's where we're headed and here's what we're calling this thing and, and here's why. And, and, and really, we're at a point there, you know, beyond language of saying, you know, if you ask the everyday employee, who do you trust the most in the organization? Quite often, it's not the boss. It's somebody at the same level as them, one of their immediate peers, mm -hmm. whether it's in or out of their team, whether it's the person they choose to take coffee with on a lunch break or whatever it is, it's the person that I immediately work with or it is certainly at my level. So what we would say is, how do you take a cross representative mix of the organization, involve them in these change pieces very early on, and then say to them, who do you trust the most in the organization? And everybody will say a minimum of three people. And then we take those three people from everybody and we add them to the process. And, and you know, Dave, you can then start to see what starts to happen is you create a network effect, uh, which is really about engaging a whole system in the process. And you might say to me, Chris, how do you get 4,000 people in a physical room? That's not the point I'm, we're making here. It's about how do you create that representative mix mm -hmm. where when those people then reach out to their colleagues that they trust to say, hey, we're involved in this. What do you think? And they give their opinion. Mm -hmm. There's this cyclical nature of trust yep. to say, I don't need to be in the room if I know that 150 other people across the organization are involved. And you come back to your point about language alignment and understanding alignment. And it, it, it but it's worth saying that there'll be people listening to this saying, but 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 why don't we see this more often then? And we're back to that sort of paradox between this this notion of um, it's faster to chunk down change in really small amounts or do it in a strategic small group and then fixate on tell and sell tactics for months because there's this feeling of, well, two things, Dave, really is it takes longer, surely, to involve more people. And now we're back to our pay, and pay now, pay later equation. And there's also this sense of it would be really chaotic. Like, Chris, how do you involve so many people, dozens and dozens of people? You need structure, you need discipline, mm -hmm. and you need you need to guide them through one decision at a time. But it's possible. There's uh, We do it. We've done it for 33 years. But it's it's unconventional, Dave, I think is the big thing, yeah. is it's it's not what you and I are perhaps used to in, in organizations. Well, I don't think it's – I don't find it – and this, again, this is me, and, I, and I, again, I'm probably leading you into an answer, just like I did before. Uh, so – full you know full disclosure that i'll be leading you into this answer i think or if you're wrong if i'm wrong then whatever um but it's not chaotic right it's uh if you've ever been around a really good marketer which I, I'm, I'm a fairly competent marketer so i've done this and that's why i say that like if you've done it with a good marketer um it it's not chaotic because it's just like as simple as something like a focus group right you could take you fly in a dozen, you know, like customer level employees and you do a focus group with them. And like you, what you have is you have a hypothesis of what you want to figure out what's going on. You talk to them. They're going to tell you because they are the closest to the customer what's going on. From there, you can go up the chain and go again. So you could it's not chaotic if you understand what you're doing, you know, and so Am I wrong, you know, or am I unusual in the fact that like when I, I can get a group of a dozen, I can facilitate a conversation with a dozen people um, and like learn just reams and reams and pages and pages of data that I wouldn't necessarily be able to get by observation or um, reading charts or whatever. And it's the furthest thing from chaos. It's, you know, it's almost beautiful in its simplicity. But again, I may be wrong. It just could be like I've got some secret sauce. I have relative differentiation. <laughs> I think, you know, there's a couple of things, Dave, and, and one of which I would challenge, which is um, this idea of uh, flying 12 people in and talking to them for a time bound period of time. How many times do we see in an organization that those same 12 people then fly out and never hear from you again? Oh, that's or, absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. Or they they. Maybe they're involved, but it's a prolonged period of time afterwards. So one of our pieces around this integrated approach to what we would call both the technical change. So whatever you're trying to um, get to within your focus group, but also the social and the behavioral change. 
So for us, it's about continuity. If we start with 12, how do we ask those 12 for their recommendations on people that they trust that then should be brought into the process? And it's beautiful, Dave, because some people will say, hey, listen, I've got a colleague called Dave, right? And he would he would be in violent disagreement with this. I mean, he's the biggest naysayer in the organization. Yeah. And Dave, you know what we say? Bring him in. Because yeah. it's that balance of perspective and that diversity mm-hmm. of input that that gets you to what what you had uh, changed in my title, which is about sticky change. And and the stickiness of change is also about the continuity, because Dave, uh, in our work, I cannot or or the team here cannot be seen as the owners of this change. We right. are the facilitators, mm-hmm. and you've got to get to a point where there's a critical mass in the organisation that says this is ours, not yours. And if you look at that in a leadership dynamic. The leaders, not only do they fear chaos, they fear losing control. I come back to my point. The underlying choices and accountability within the business model may well reside at a senior leadership level. Why wouldn't it? They can guide, they can point the direction, but we're into a concept in systems thinking, Dave, around laddering, which talks about defining the why, defining the intent, which is our strategy and our choices, and then talking about what the organization must achieve. In our language, that's called the the, the criteria, the, the design criteria that, that frames our choices, right? The organization must achieve these things. We live by it. And then all of the rest of our choices flow from there. Now, beyond that, we talk about not the why, but the how. Now, here's, your, here's one of our observations about traditional uh, leadership or, or traditional cultures as it relates to this change, uh, notion of change being hard is the leaders try and own the why and the how. We're not trying to take away control from them, but what we are trying to do is say, trust the wisdom of the crowd, because bringing those people together and expanding your focus group continuously throughout the process, people start to own the change. They define the how, but more importantly, Dave, when we get to this thing, which is often framed as implementation, and we turn this thing on and we try and turn off the old way of working, what we would call the operating model, and and you start asking people to live the new, they live the new very authentically because they've been involved and they say, this is ours to own and I will take personal responsibility to see it through. And here we are in a conversation about if we often work with pioneering leaders, Dave, it won't surprise you. People that are willing to say, do you know what, on the mark, I agree with you. I'm here to set the strategic direction, but I can't do it on my own. I will involve the whole workforce. I will pay now to reap the rewards later. And then these are the leaders that are sat having conversations every day to say, how have we achieved the results that we have? And there's a word at the center of all of this, Dave, which is about involvement of of people. Yeah, no, this is interesting. And it it especially, I want to underline this point. And I would, again, if if it was a video podcast, I would have my blackboard out and I would underline it many, many times. Uh, when I go into an organization the same way you do, I tell people one of the first things is going, I'm not the agent of change. Right. You are. You are the agent of change. I'm here to help, but I can't be the person. You know, that's why, like, some of these things I see people do and I'm like, oh, you, you can't because as an outsider, you don't have responsibility. You don't have power. So you have to, like, really do. You, you have to underline this over and over again because where I see these kind of projects fail for people, and I think this is the point, is because they expect that the the consultant or the person, the organization they're bringing in to partner on these change management projects or these uh, change initiatives are, uh, that they're going to somehow wave a magic wand and everything's going to change. No, it's a process that you've begun because you are the agent of change. Uh, it's not going to, it shouldn't be chaos. It should be consistent, right? And the the actions have to start from the top and they have to flow down because I think some of the reason that these patterns of um, uh, they die hard, they don't change is because the person at the top, the person who starts the change process holds onto the power too too tightly or wants to give it up completely. And he doesn't want to be involved in it. And you don't see the um, the language, the attention, the consistency that's needed to change. To me, change takes radical consistency. Right. And you have to be like, because you, you, you have to know it's going to be a messy process. It's not chaotic. Again, I, uh, if you're doing it well, there's going to, it's going to be messy because getting people to change old habits is hard. 
but it won't be chaotic because there should be consistency in the actions. Like you can you clean up the mess, but if it's chaos, then you screwed up somewhere. Um, but why, what do you see as far as like patterns and like, they're not, not sticking, you know, they, or they stick too long. Right. And you can't get rid of these old patterns, you know, like, because to me, it's either too much, control or just completely trying to divorce the control you know is there somewhere in the middle that you see it or is it is that the two extremes really where it falls down well i think you know listening to some of what you've described there dave the um we 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 also um would use this phrase of you know patterns die hard right and one of the interesting questions comes back to what you described earlier on is what are we trying to achieve or what how would we define success now what we often find uh, if we're engaged by uh, uh, leaders or teams to say hey on the mark can you help me come in you say yeah sure we, we sit down and have a conversation we say um why are we having this conversation you know what has triggered you to want to speak to us and it often re- revolves around performance it's not businesses are failing it could be that they're realizing that they could be doing more or or whatever it is, but we're having a conversation about success. Almost every time they're sat scratching their heads to say, I can't get people to do what I need them to do. And one of our fundamental principles is nothing changes, Dave, until behavior changes. Mm -hmm. So you can produce a strategy, you can change a process, you can change a service, and you can roll it out into the organization and try and get buy-in. But I'm at risk of sounding like a, a, a broken record. If those people haven't been involved, then they don't fundamentally understand. But more importantly, them and only them are able to make their own choices. And we're we're down to personal responsibility. Do I choose to behave like this or do I choose to behave like this? And I need to understand why um, and and what would drive me to do one over the other. And And our point behind the patterns die hard is that you know, our, our fundamental belief, Dave, based on all of the work we do, is you cannot tell people into change. You cannot tell them into positive perception. Only they can internalize that and make their own choices. So uh, technically, you might walk around a business and say, hey, guys, we have achieved our uh, uh, our strategic result. And you say, why is that? Because the posters that that are on the wall in every staff canteen up and down this nation say, say to me that the the leader has executed what we've asked them to do and of course you've then got this um gap between then employees walking past that poster and making paying no attention to it and and i know it's a very very simple example but but the point being is that is not a success measure to say somebody's executed a process it's about Mm -hmm. saying are people doing what we need them to do from a behaviors point of view and uh, for, for us they only do that if they've been involved and they understand and they're able to let go of the old and adopt mm-hmm. the new because they agree with it because they support it because they were they, they were involved in the creation well the old is there for a reason too because you've you've been rewarded for however long for doing things that way and so the reward for doing things the new quote unquote right way must be greater than doing them the old way and again that the example you use of like going oh we plastered our walls with all these slogans and all of these things you can't you you can't tell people what to perceive, but what you can do is you can manage the uh, the art of perception for people, and you don't do that with words. You do it with actions and ideas right. and incentives, right? And that and that's one of the ways I see people struggling to to make change stick is like, you know, I'm going to tell you what's going to be different and better. No, you got to show me because the only then do I see it that it's like I can buy into this now. Because and then the perceptions change because they see that they've heard the vision, then they see it taking place, and then they they see at people taking action, and then likely they're starting to jump on there. And and there's our you know your 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 description between words and action is a beautiful thing that we see in organisations between authentic involvement, which is action, versus manipulation, which is words, which is again the sort of cajoling and the you know the 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 buy-in stuff comes from. The words being spoken in very one-way dialogue, or if it's two-way dialogue, I'm really asking you uh, uh, to 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 agree with me, and that's that that sort of manipulation end. But we are really trying to show leaders through through really great examples of some of those leading businesses you described earlier on, Dave, that that are pioneers and they do go out there and they do involve and they do trust, 
And they they have that really clear boundary to say, here's what I'm here to do. And here's what is up for grabs in terms of your being involved with. But but we're talking there about authentic involvement and trust, not manipulation through words and posters and memos and, and you name it. Right. All right. So what I like to do at the end of these conversations, or I try to do it, I don't always do it. Like, you know, there's no real structure to this thing all the time. It's just like, hopefully I have conversations with people that are smarter than me um, that can give people some ideas that they can use. Um, but because I understand the importance of this change and I understand like interrupting patterns is so difficult, what would be like the first step or two that you would tell advise people to if they're thinking about uh, some sort of organization wide change? You know, what would be the first one, two, three things that they should do before calling us, obviously? Um, I mean, that would be the first. That's the first step. Just call me or Chris. It's fine. We'll help. <laughs> I, I could say that the, the thing not to do is 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 not to sit down and write a vision statement and put it on a poster all right and, and there's more to that than the action of the poster dave and what i mean is it's very easy to write a future direction but it's very difficult to achieve it if you don't understand the foundations in which you already stood on so the first step for me would be um if we are waking up in the morning and we are starting to think or have a conversation at whatever level in the organization that something needs to change how do we start to build a common database around what that change might need to be? It is simply not good enough for a CEO to wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to change because I've got this single view of the world. And I don't know many CEOs, Dave, that wake up that sort of arrogant with self-confidence in the morning and do that. The challenge being is that when the problem statement or the opportunity statement is shared in the C-suite, there's this sort of uh, potential group think that risks is, well, we've got 10 or 12 of us around the room. Who may who may passionately believe in that change and therefore let's let's make it happen very quickly so for me that the, the the first step has got to be when we recognize the symptoms or the opportunity there the signals if you like of of a, of a problem or an opportunity it's to say how do we how do we test our early assumptions how do we get enough cross representation so we can broaden and enhance our perspective about whether our hunch or our intuition or that data there that tells us to change is right that doesn't need to take months or weeks, Dave. It can take days, but it cannot be done in a small strategic group. It must be done by a cross representative uh, that can represent the system. For me, that is step one. What foundations are we stood on now? The information or the data or the signs or the signals that we're looking at in terms of the opportunity to move in a changed or adapted direction or a fundamentally different one. Before we take that big leap and write that vision statement, how do we test our understanding of today? because those 10 or 12 people in the C-suite do not do the work of the organization every single day. And therefore we've got to reach down and say to people, you know, are our assumptions true and how can you enrich our understanding of, of, of the, the wider system of work? And then from there, anything, you know, like, or, or is that like such an important point that like get that right before you go anywhere else? And I, I know I know the answer because I I just want to underline it for for everybody. If you don't diagnose the problem first, you're doomed to fail. Right. And and you got three options, um, Dave. And it really is as simple as this. Um. And and this is where natural bias can sometimes come in because, uh, even as a, a, a as a uh, what I would like to call myself and and the OTM team a very trusted and ethical, uh, grounded uh, consultancy is sometimes Dave we've been pulled into those early conversations. We've helped an organization do that, as you call it, the sort of the, the diagnosis or that wider sort of system review. Um, and organizations have said, uh huh. So we weren't right and we're OK. And actually, we were just perhaps blindsided and we didn't have access to that information or our assumption was was misguided. And therefore, option number one is do nothing because we're not as bad as what we th thought we were or the opportunity that we thought was worth pursuing because we've involved that wider perspective has turned out to be uh, false. And, and it's amazing how many organizations perhaps think that they're going into this conversation, assuming that something is going to happen. So option one is do nothing, Dave. Option two mm -hmm. is, do you know what? We found out that the problem isn't as big as what we first thought, but there are certainly opportunities to improve. So we're going to optimize a part of perhaps our, our customer offering, um, you know, our value proposition, 
our price point if it's part of a, a broad, broader business model or part of our operation you know we're going to you know optimize the way in which we um, execute this process or, or whatever that is right and i would call that a, you know an optimization decision option three though is by in, by involving the wider system have we actually expanded our understanding of the problem to what i would hope we get to is sort of you know a real root cause analysis to say do you know what we've actually exposed more than what we originally thought our hunch and our intuition or that opening information and data was true but we've got a much bigger problem on our hands and we need more of a fundamental sort of change yeah no that, that seems right to me um now chris you guys do a lot of um really great webinars and you do have a lot of really great uh other work that we can point people to where can people find some of this stuff on the internet what did you think about my conversation with Chris? There was a lot of really great stuff there. Um, a lot of stuff to reframe some of your thinking around change, at least in my opinion. So give Chris a follow on the LinkedIn and check out their website. There's a lot of really great webinars and all kinds of great stuff that they do. Um, make sure you check out my website. It's www.davewakeman.com. Like I said, this is going to drop the week of the 16th of January. And from the 23rd to the 26th, I will be in Seattle uh, hanging out with the Cover Genius people. Um, Wednesday and Thursday, I will be at the Cover Genius booth uh, hosting some live podcasts doing eight minutes from Intix. It's going to be amazing. Um, Thursday morning on the Inspiration stage, I will be leading a conversation with Joe from Cover Genius, uh, Joanne from Audience View, and a surprise guest about the customer journey, uh, enhancing the customer path. Um, it's going to be a really interesting conversation that will be helpful for you uh, and give you some new ideas to consider, some new data, and just give you a better understanding of what's driving people's purchase habits right now. Uh, they have changed since the pandemic, uh, and the challenge a lot of us are dealing with is understanding what that means to the way we market and sell our products and services now. So make sure you check us out, check us out on the inspiration stage on Thursday, the 26th of January. Um, you can also email me, david, and I will make sure I'll send you a link to everything so you can't miss us.
do visit the Cover Genius website at covergenius.com. Find data and ways to use refund protection. Um, there's lots of really interesting case studies. Uh, check it out and find out more. Uh, make sure you get the Talking Tickets newsletter. It's talkingtickets.substack.com. That's my Friday newsletter all about tickets. Or you can get the Business of Value. It's businessofvalue.substack.com, and that's where I talk about uh, marketing and strategy. Um, make sure you visit the website, like I mentioned, because there is a lot of exciting things going on in the world of Dave. Uh, that's so blowhardy. But please take a minute to check out the pricing survey in the show notes. Uh, it will help me. Uh, I have been doing a ton of pricing stuff. It's um, been something that's really been helpful to people. So I'm going to continue to advance that, uh, give you tools and ideas to help manage the perception around your price, uh, make the sale on the price to your senior leadership, and give you new strategies to help make sure you're pricing effectively. So that's in the show notes. Please do it. If you dig the podcast, the newsletter, any of this crap <laughs> for lack of a better talk, any of the stuff I do, please share it with your colleagues or your friends or people that you think will benefit from this. Um, you know, if you like the podcast, also rate it and review it. It helps people discover the podcast. It helps make sure that the podcast continues to grow. It helps me get really great guests, um, as I have been, continued to do. Um, interesting conversations, uh, you know, so do all of that, please. It would mean the world to me. Uh, finally, as I've been saying for years now, uh, if you need a shoulder, to, uh, somebody to talk to, a shoulder to lean on, um, somebody just to, um, you know, crack some jokes and make you feel a little better. I know the past few years have been really, really tough for people. Send me a note. I'm happy to be uh, a sounding board for you. You know, crack a couple jokes, you know, make fun of stuff. It's, it's what I do. Um, I don't want you to feel like you're alone here. Uh, you know, so that's David, Dave Wakeman.com. You know, we can chat for a few minutes uh, and I can tell you some awful dad jokes and, you know, maybe give you some insights or an idea or two that'll help you, um, you know, find some direction or figure out something. Or if I just crack jokes and you feel better and laugh a little bit, then that's a W2, as, as the kids say. Um, but thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I will hopefully see you in Seattle. Um, until next time, thanks for listening. I'll talk to you soon. Take it easy.